Just a reminder, hashtag CAF 2018. Please follow us. And now we begin our first panel discussion entitled Deadly Immigration into Europe and the Rise of Right-Wing Politics. We have several distinguished speakers, but I'm going to invite the moderator up to the podium to introduce in a little more detail the topic, and of course she will then introduce each of the speakers. Leila Dean is a barrister in England and Wales. She's a visiting law lecturer, academic researcher at the University of Westminster, and former CEO of Basic Human Rights, that's an international non-profit organization. Let's extend a warm hand to her. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is the first of the three panel discussions today, and the first panel discussion on deadly migration and the rise of the right wing. As Anne was saying, in a former life, I was the founder and CEO of Basic Human Rights. And I assume the majority of people in this room will have borne witness to the suffering and plight of the most vulnerable people fleeing disasters and conflicts. They flee for many reasons. Lack of access, access to food, water, shelter, and justice. We will all agree that these are basic human rights. Unfortunately, of recent times, we've seen that people striving for a more peaceful existence are met with barriers, walls, fences, and barbed wires, and the deadly of which are, because of, one would argue, the EU policy, which is incoherent, um, boats that are being turned back, forced back. Those that are lucky can, may, may find a shore, and those that are not scum to one of history's largest graveyards, the Mediterranean Sea. I'm going to, before I introduce the panel um, of experts here, I'd like to, I'd like to pause and let you think about this quote from the late Kofi Annand. Today, no walls can separate humanitarian or human rights crises in one part of the world from national security crises in another. What begins with the failure to uphold dignity of one life all too often ends with the calamity for entire nations. Ladies and gentlemen, the panel speakers we have today, the first of the speaker is Mr. Asil Ahmed, partner of Baybas Ventures, an investment advisory group focusing on the growth opportunities in emerging markets. Mr. Asil will be followed by Nazneen Mosheri, UN member of Somalia Eritrea panel of experts. Nazneen, prior to that, has endured a, um, a career, a 17 year career in broadcasting and news. She thrived in some of the most dynamic newsrooms in the world, leading teams on complex and often dangerous missions. Mr. Mohamed Dango is the former South African ambassador to Libya, Syria, and Saudi Arabia. Mr. Dango and his siblings joined the struggle at the early age and five of his nine siblings actively took part in the struggle, in the South African struggle. And the final speaker is a legal practitioner, Ayo Obe. Ayo is the trustee of the Brussels think tank, International Crisis Group. And in Nigeria, she's on the board of the ZO, and excuse me, the PC Memorial Libraries, 
and the Edgungunle Community Project. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a, a warm welcome to Mr. Athel Ahmed as the first speaker. Okay, good morning. Um, thank you for uh, having me join the panel. And uh, let me just uh, make a few quick uh, comments to explain why I joined the panel this morning uh, and what I'll be talking about. I'm not actually talking about migration into Europe, um, but I was, I think, asked to join uh, the group here because of my background and experience working in Malaysia, where in the last six months there's been one of the few uh, hopeful stories to emerge uh, in the world uh, in the last few years when it comes to um, the uh, sustainability of democracy and the ability for activists to fight back against narratives which um, might lead to a more um, extreme right-wing or extreme uh, violent uh, standpoint. So um, in addition to um, what I'm doing with my uh, investment company, I've worked as an advisor to Anwar Ibrahim in Malaysia for the last 15 years. And in, in that role, I have experienced, I think, um, most of the last two decade arc of his experience uh, trying to fight for reform and democracy in his country. Um, and uh, uh, particularly the two uh, periods that he spent in incarceration. And then obviously um, what happened in May of this year when his opposition coalition uh, was able to win an election against pretty much all um, predictions. So uh, why is the Malaysia story important? I think that um, particularly because uh, that election happened um, uh, in the context of so many uh, uh, examples, both in Southeast Asia as well as throughout the majority Muslim world of democracy really basically uh, uh, being uh, in, uh, in defense and authoritarianism coming back uh, to challenge uh, uh, what people might view as, uh, people viewed as sort of being the general trend towards democracy in, in the 90s and in the 2000s. So um, if you're not familiar with the Malaysian context, uh, it's, a very, uh, it's a very multi-ethnic society, 60% uh, uh, Malay Muslim, 30% Chinese, and 10% Indian. And uh, as you would expect, it makes for very complex uh, social and political arrangements. Um, in addition to that, um, as a result of, uh, of many factors, uh, the Malay Muslim majority is seen to be um, economically disadvantaged vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Chinese. And that further com uh, complicates the political dimension in terms of understanding how these three different communities can coexist peacefully uh, and share political power. Um, uh, the, uh, there's also the... Um, uh, element of Islam as a religion. Uh, Islam in Southeast Asia historically has been a, uh, if you compare it to perhaps the expression of Islam in other parts of the world, more inclusive and more pluralistic. Um, and uh, again, for a variety of factors, I think particularly because Southeast Asia has been, um, uh, has, has benefited from not having uh, significant geopolitical conflicts and wars. Um, generally stayed uh, in the non-aligned movement during the period of the Cold War, that uh, Islam didn't take on a very um, aggressive political uh, aspect to it. Um, and you have a legacy of Sufism and a legacy of uh, uh, the sort of need to um, have the different religious groups uh, working together and mixing. Um, so, uh, if if you look at the specific political aspects of uh, Malaysia and why this, why this election was so significant, um, one of the things that you really need to understand is the economic uh, positioning of Malays and non-Malays. So uh, since Malaysian independence, um, there's been this need to balance and figure out a way to uplift all groups. But because the Malays uh, at the end of the colonial period were uh, predominantly in the lower income group and predominantly less educated, um, there was a need to uh, uh, implement certain affirmative action policies to try to uplift that community. 
and create more parity in the society. Um, those policies, which uh, really started in the late 60s and early 70s, um, have become one of the things that I think Malaysia is, is known for, is these Bumiputra, Bumiputra, which means the, literally the sons of the soil, so the indigenous population, were given uh, a number of privileges, both in the constitution, but also uh, gradually uh, in the sort of informal rules of economic, uh, civil, uh, civil service, um, and business. And so those policies were designed to basically bring the Malay community, which had maybe 10% of the overall equity in the country in terms of uh, ownership of companies and involvement in school and education, uh, up to 30 or 40%. Um, however, as, as we know, and I'm, and I'm not an expert on the situation here, but uh, those types of policies, if not managed well, can lead to tremendous uh, uh, um, rent-seeking behavior and corruption. And that's exactly what has happened in Malaysia whereby um, the policy uh, essentially created a class of ultra-wealthy elites who's, who were expected to uh, sort of trickle down the wealth that they were getting from uh, government contracts and other special access that they had. Um, but in fact, um, if you look at Malaysia's track record over the last 20 years, inequality has generally risen, the rich have gotten richer, the poor have gotten poorer, and more importantly, um, you can't just say that the poor are only Malays. There are poor uh, Chinese, there are poor Indians. You have huge problems of uh, urban poor, which affect all the communities, and the government wasn't uh, really responding to those uh, needs. Um, so, uh, Anwar Ibrahim, uh, when he was jailed in 1998, uh, the, the movement started, the uh, Justice Party of Malaysia started, uh, to essentially create a new paradigm for how Malaysia is going to uh, confront these challenges. And the key aspect uh, that the Justice Party, I think, represents is a multi-ethnic party. It's the first truly multi-ethnic party in Malaysia, whereas all the other parties are essentially catering to one of the three major ethnic groups. Um, and it's taken the better part of 20 years for uh, that sentiment to really sort of, I think, permeate society and make people feel comfortable with the notion that um, you can have a multi-ethnic party leading a coalition that can take care of the needs of all, uh, of all Malaysians. Um, now, it has not been easy, and I think uh, sort of to bring this back to the topic of our conversation, um, throughout the last 20 years, and really throughout, I think, uh, Malaysia's post-independence history, there's been this, this uh, current or this strand of trying to play up uh, the racial sentiments of the, uh, what is perceived to be marginalized majority and use that mixed with a um, probably more extreme version of Isl Islamic nationalism or Islamic Malay nationalism to say that if the Malays lose power, then um, the Chinese are gonna take over. And, and these types of uh, uh, very jingoistic or ultra-nationalistic -nat rhetoric start to take root. I'll, I'll give two examples, um, and, and there's many of these, I think, uh, uh, th that we could talk about, but um, whenever there's a sense, uh, you know, elections are coming up or something is in the news that might suggest that um, uh, there's going to be some tension between the groups, then these uh, sentiments get um, sort of exacerbated. So I was in Malaysia from about 2007 until 2010, and I had to leave in 2010, and the context of why I had to leave was that um, a Catholic newspaper uh, had published some articles uh, in which they um, highlighted Anwar Ibrahim's return to political activity and put him on the front page of the news. And this was seen to be unacceptable, I think, by the government because of the uh, control that the government had on the, the media. Um, as a result, that paper was closed down. But the reason given was that they were using the word Allah, which is the Arabic word for God, in the Malay text to refer to God. Now, uh, why is that a problem? Well. Uh, some, some words from, Ar many words from Arabic have entered the Malay um, lexicon as just everyday words that everybody uses. Um, however, uh, throughout the period of the last 15 or 20 years, some laws were passed that essentially prevented Christians from using certain words. Um, and the argument given was that they might be used as a uh, way of proselytizing and confusing the Malays, as if uh, Christians in Egypt, for example, don't use the word Allah in their own Bibles. So it was this very unique uh, ruling that was given in Malaysia, but essentially it was to uh, 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 convey the sense that the government controlled by the Malays 
could intervene in the internal affairs of the non-Malay communities. Um, so uh, a judge eventually, after a few years of appeals, ruled that that uh, law was unconstitutional and that that paper should never have been shut down. And as soon as that happened, uh, some churches in Malaysia were attacked by a group of ultra-Malay nationalists, probably uh, encouraged by the government, although that was never proven. Um, and no one was really injured, but uh, it, gen it generated a lot of negative press for the country. Um, and uh, soon after that, I was actually mentioned in the news as having been involved in some of that stuff. Now, I wasn't involved in any of that stuff, but again, that was part of the, 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 the atmosphere of, uh, I guess many of you probably familiar when authoritarian governments try to disrupt opposition uh, groups. Um, another example, a uh, small example was, uh, I think during one of the Indian celebrations, a group of Muslims were protesting the construction of an Indian temple in a predominantly Muslim neighborhood and walked through the streets kicking a, the head of a cow. Uh, again, a very offensive thing to do, but um, uh, uh, these types of things tended to happen. So now that we've had an election in Malaysia that uh, brought a multi-ethnic coalition into power for the first time in uh, a true multi-ethnic coalition in power for the first time in 61 years, and it's the first time that the Malaysian, uh, the previous regime, lost an election since independence. Um, there's some hope for some real change, and I think some of the key things uh, that we should be looking for in Malaysia are, uh, again, the government ultimately has to deliver on growth and development. Um, I think that uh, the key policy is that um, you know Malaysia is an open sort of economy and is going to attract foreign investment, but that um, there needs to be very solid policies to ensure that uh, the marginalized, irrespective of race and religion, receive the aid and the support that they need. I think if Malaysia is able to do that and navigate out of uh, this sort of trap of uh, that middle income economies are in, where by, um, again, wealth continues to get concentrated in the top uh, you know, few percentage of the, of the uh, population, then the world would, would start to see, number one, that it is possible with good governance to reorient the trajectory of a country. And number two, I think also importantly that um, post-Arab Spring, a Muslim-led uh, political coalition can actually govern effectively, tend to the needs of both the Muslims but also the non-Muslims and start to reshape that narrative as well, which is uh, something that for the most part, um, I think we've, we've kind of lost the plot on since the, since the Arab Spring, so. Thank you, Russell. Thank you. What we intend to do is um, 10 minutes for each speaker and then um, to leave some time for questions and answers um, at the end of that. That brings us nicely to uh, what Nazneen's topic is, um, is going to be about and um, thank you for the jingoistic language that you, you, you were talking about and people tapping into insecurities and fears. Yeah. Nazneen. Thank, thank you, you. Leila. I'd like to thank the Common Action Forum for inviting me to speak today. Um, as a first-generation immigrant to the United Kingdom uh, from Iran, I'm all too conscious of how lucky I am. I've had incredible opportunities and the freedom to pursue my dreams, where I've had to watch helplessly as relatives and friends of mine were, in some cases, sent back to their country of origin because of bureaucracy, or for some, as traumatized refugees with little or no education, have had to uh, contend with not being able to build a decent life or pursuing the dreams that I have been able to follow. Now this feeling of never really quite belonging mixed with a sense of guilt about the fact that I was so lucky and others haven't been is one of the reasons why I became a journalist in the first place and now a UN investigator. And perhaps it's driven me in a way to risk my own safety uh, to, to get the voices of the most vulnerable out there. Now, in my career, I've spoken to many politicians, policymakers, refugees, asylum seekers, and as most journalists and researchers will tell you, that there are characters that you speak to who will continue to have an impact on you for the rest of your life. Now, around four years ago, I was working on a project on migration from Africa to Europe, and I met a man, a young man called Mamadou from Abidjan, who was plucked out of the Mediterranean and brought to Tunisia, where I met him. Now, with all the risks involved, he wanted to give it another go, to try again. So I asked him, why on earth would you do it again? And his answer was like so many answers that I'd heard before. 
He had no choice. He would never be able to earn enough money to settle down and have, have a family or help his family. So basically, a chance of a life was better than no life at all. Throughout Europe as well, I've met refugees who fled political persecution or war. Uh, one example is a young journalist who I'd met years earlier in Mogadishu, who I met uh, in Malta. Now, he had actually fulfilled his dream. He'd managed to make it to Europe. He touched and felt European soil, which he was happy about. But what he wasn't so happy about was that he'd ended up in a military-run detention center where I met him where asylum seekers can be locked up for up to 18 months waiting to be processed. Now this harsh treatment of course is to discourage others from coming to Europe and it worked because the people I spoke to in there told me their message was do not try this because you'll end up like we have in this military run detention centre. And there was Mahmoud uh, Aded from Somalia who I met in a camp uh, in Libya with no food or medicine or little clean water. And he asked me, in fact, he actually begged me, uh, I want a better life. Can you tell me how to get it? And it really made me feel ashamed. I did have a better life, but what could I do to help people like him achieve their dreams? So when I finally did settle down in Tunisia, I attempted to help two uh, young immigrants that I'd met one from Gambia, one from Ivory Coast. And what I did was I paid for them to travel from southern Tunisia to northern Tunisia. I found them a job. But my plans were scuppered when they were arrested by the police and basically put in detention, ready to be deported. And this is the problem uh, in many countries, that when you do try to help people, uh, when they do manage to make it to Tunisia or whatever, they're not allowed to work. They're not allowed to get an education. They're not allowed to do anything. They're not allowed to help, allowed access to healthcare. I'm going to touch on this a bit later on, but uh, just to finish the story about the, the two young men that I met, uh, I managed to get them out of detention. One of them went to Libya and got to Italy, and he's fine. The other one was so disillusioned by the experience of risking his life again and again, ending up in the detention centre in Tunisia, he basically went back to Gambia to try to build a better life for himself. Now, when reporting on these issues, I noted that journalists and commentators, all of us, including myself, followed the norms of distinguishing refugees from asylum seekers, from economic migrants and immigrants. So in the camps that I spoke to with, with people in Libya and in Tunisia, they were running from war, human rights abuses, but, and we called them refugees. But Tunisians, uh, and people like Mamadou, who wanted to escape years of joblessness, we call them economic migrants. So an asylum seeker has left their country and is seeking protection from persecution. A refugee has already received such protection. Now, the 1951 UN Convention, which I'm sure many of us have read, relating to the status of refugees, defines a refugee as a person uh, possessing well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, or membership of a particular social group or political opinion. But what about those fleeing environmental disasters, such as flooding or desertification? The 1951 Convention doesn't define these people as refugees at all. But, as Bill Frecht Frelick, who I know from Human Rights Watch, says, if someone's life is in danger, it really shouldn't matter if it's because of gun, uh, because of a gun, or because of a landslide or an earthquake. The International Organization for Migration defines a migrant as any person who's moving or has moved across an international border, regardless of legal status, whether the movement is voluntary or involuntary, what the causes for the movement are, and what the length of stay is. Now, I would argue that in some ways, these distinctions that we use and have become commonplace are a get-out clause for many rich countries, particularly in Europe. Some say it even dehumanizes one group in favor of another, making migrant, as we've heard, and the word immigrant, a dirty word uh, used in some European countries. And I suggest that we need to open our minds to other types of reasons people migrate and stop falling back on the overused distinctions between refugees and migrants. Now, during my time reporting on both sides of the Mediterranean, and particularly my time in, in the Horn of Africa, I've come to the conclusion that while the world is closing borders, 
while the world is building walls. I think that the solution, and many, it's not just me who thinks, many people have put this forward, but I think the solution is actually fairer, freer borders with more opportunities. But I do agree with those who say that we need more open borders, yes, but they have to come in hand in hand with domestic and international policies that can address labour market forces, for example, and manage economic tensions that become rife when you do have open borders. But I disagree wholeheartedly with those who've used the fear of more open borders and the refugee crisis in Europe for political gains. We've seen it all across Europe, from Hungary to Sweden to Italy. Uh, we've seen nationalists and far-right parties making gains. We've also seen people who've taken office sort of moving towards more centrist positions in order to adapt to this, this changing position that we're seeing. Now, of course, this is all part of a backlash uh, against the political establishment. We've seen it everywhere. But this movement also taps into a long-standing uh, fears about globalization and national identity, which we heard from Wada at Canfa yesterday. Um, it also taps into fears that more global migration will lead to uncertainty, disorder, and violence. And I argue that's just not true. Now, I will never forget a young man I met in Malta uh, another young man who was actually not living in the detention center, but outside. He was an Ethiopian who fled the country in 2004. He was doing a master's at the time, and his vision gave me real hope. He said to me that Africa is changing, and one day you, will, you won't see Africans fleeing Europe, you will see uh, Europeans coming to Africa. Now, Europe's plan, I guess, is in part to make that happen. Um, Jean-Claude Juncker announced a programme to create up to 10 million jobs in Africa. And I agree with this, Africa needs the investment, but I think Europe is missing a big opportunity. Economists believe that opening up borders would make the world richer, it would make Europe richer. One of the main reasons is that workers uh, who move from poorer countries to richer countries, of course, are more productive. If you were paid more and treated better, wouldn't you move elsewhere? Of course you would. Um, migrants often triple their wages uh, after moving to a new country, helping millions of migrants, but also helping their relatives back home. And destination countries benefit too. I mean, just look at Silicon Valley. Uh, migrants have, have played a critical role in advancing technology there. Just look at the Middle East and all the financial hubs. Migrants have built those financial hubs. In Kenya, where I live, the Kakuma camp is a great example. And if you have a chance, you should read up on what's going on there. A World Bank study from 2016 found that the gross regional product of Kenya's whole Turkana region increased by 3.4% as a result of the refugees' presence there. And according to the World Bank, refugees are boosting economic growth everywhere. There are, of course, politicians out there who are exploiting fears, and we, we all know that. But research has shown that countries gain more than they lose from immigration. So look, this creates a puzzle, which I've been thinking about long and hard. There's compelling economic evidence, we can't deny it, that there are economic gains and social benefits of migration. But how does this sit with a stark political opposition to immigration? Now, all the, if you read many political polls, they'll tell you that one of the biggest fears people have is migration. And we've seen that in the rounds of elections in Western Europe, we've seen it in the US as well. Um, so many economists think that people are ignoring these findings or economists aren't convincing people of these findings and many economists attribute political opposition to cultural and social factors including xenophobia. My second reason for disagreeing with the rhetoric is a moral one. Now why should we accept we live in this so-called global village where being born is basically a lottery, a chance. How can anyone justify forcing poor people to stay in a poor country and rich countries excluding others from their fortunate situation? <coughs> I just can't accept that. There's also an argument that there exists a human right to immigrate. I'm not necessarily saying it's a human right to uh, get citizenship, but uh, there, we do have a human right to enter another country, spend time there, and this actually comes from the Universal Declared Human Rights to Freedom of Movement, Association, 
and occupational choice. Finally, we are living in an interconnected world. The UN estimates that 258 million people now live in places other than their country of birth, an increase of nearly 50% since 2000. We can't deny this, we can't stop this, we can't prevent this. It's going to happen, whether we like it or not. But we, practitioners, policymakers, journalists, researchers, we really have to do more to influence policy worldwide with evidence and change things if we can. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you. <clears throat> you will all agree an emotive talk and burning questions. If Europe can absorb people fleeing, why aren't they? Um, this, the distinction and definitions are these excuses. And this leads me to our next guest speaker, Mohamed Dango. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me on the panel and for sharing some of my thoughts. What I'm going to speak about initially is about Libya, what had happened in Libya, what gave rise to the problems and the racism that exists within Libya today, and what are possible solutions, if any. I will talk about dignity, non-racialism, non-sexism in a second panel that I'm about, so I'm not going to address that here. <coughs> Libya that I lived in for five years, almost six years. Before the uprising, during the uprising, and after the uprising. Before the uprising, it was a magnet for workers from West Africa, from Chad. There was a million Egyptians working in Libya. And then came the uprising and the collapse of the Libyan state, resulting in the national question, uh, and the national question is terminology uh, in our terms in South Africa for racism, for the rise of tribalism and the rise of, of regional uh, interest of power. The collapse of state today you have in, in Libya two governments, and you have a third one supported by the United Nations. None of them, in fact, have got influence on the militias that are in every city. Um, at times they change sides, at times they co-opt them, at times they bring them in. But all of this has got to do with the curse of resources, the stealing of the oil. And at one time, I was a bit frustrated sitting in Libya, and a good friend of our mine and many of ours, uh, Ashur Shamis, who in fact translated the book of Nelson Mandela, The Long Walk to Freedom into Arabic, said to me, you know, you must read in the situation. Go and read an ancient scholar called uh, uh, Ibn Khaldun, and you will understand that there's good solidarity and bad solidarity. He used the Arabic word as sabiyah. And I said to him, Ashur, what are you talking about? He said, well, A, every city now wants to look after itself. Every political leader in that city is looking after that city's interest and their own interests. Two is you have the regional interest. Egypt on the one side, Algeria on the other side, Tunisia on the other side, Chad to the south, all looking at their own interest in Libya. And then you have the international solidarity of people, and some of them said to me, you know, the issue in Libya was a NATO-led uprising supported by some Libyans. Of course, there was the, the issue of there was resources given to people, but essentially people were robbed of their dignity. And I think that is why you had the problems that, that came about uh, in Libya. So you have the curse of resources, a failed state, and a West that was aware of what, in fact, was going on. The late American ambassador to Libya was killed, Chris Stevens, and ourselves, and Gaddafi forced us for a long time to sit for many hours talking to each other. Uh, the West actually was aware of what was going to happen. So there was no accident that they didn't know what they were promoting. And Bernard Levy, particularly, and some of the West, including the BBC, promoted a, a narrative of Africans, African mercenaries, coming to support Gaddafi, 
the use of Viagra, the question of rape, none of those things have been proved. None of those things uh, have ever gone to court. But what they did do was prevent African solutions to African problems. I was present in, a, uh, a, um, in Mauritania with five African presidents that were going to go to Libya to find a political solution. <coughs> that night, the Secretary General of the UN called and said, you can't go. The friends have said they're going to start bombing tonight, and your safety is not guaranteed. So quite clearly, NATO and the French in particular wanted a military outcome and not a political solution to, uh, to the problem. So we then go back to African solutions, to African problems. Um, we will need to ask ourselves in the solution today, can the Arab League play a role? Is the Arab League capable of promoting democracy, individual rights, and human dignity in the present situation? In my view, not. The interests of Europe are to, st uh, to get the supply of oil, and any from Italy, Italy has been pumping oil throughout the, 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 um, the crisis and up to now, and stopping migrants from leaving Libya. There's an urgency to hold elections by being promoted by the UN, by the European countries, Italy is holding different meetings, the French are holding different meetings. Is that going to solve the problem? In my view, not. I think what we need to do and possibly the African Union, through five African presidents that have been appointed by the African Union now, is to allow the Libyans to talk amongst themselves, just to facilitate talks so the Libyans can talk amongst themselves to find a Libyan solution under the auspices of the African Union, together with the UN, to the problem that, that exists at the moment. The neighbors have got an initiative, and I think it's an important initiative that should be considered. Because Algeria is affected by the Libyan situation, their security. The Tunisians who used to work in Libya can no longer work there, but the Tunisian security is actually affected by that. The Egyptians have got their own reasons for supporting a particular general going forward in a, in a particular direction. But I think what you need to talk about here is the dignity of the migrants. That's important. How well, in a society that actually provided work in the past now actually ship people and move them as slaves, use them as slaves, and then ship them out to Europe? There's a contradiction in that particular society. That society is 98% Muslim. Most of them follow one particular school of thought. So the divisions are not around sect. The divisions are not around uh, religion. The divisions about who controls the resources in Libya, whether they be the human resources that are being exploited or the oil resources of Libya that are being exploited. But then I want to come to the question of migrants coming to Africa and migrants coming to South Africa. Libya was an attraction to the north for workers. South Africa came, became an attraction to the south. And we didn't put people into camps. We allowed people their human dignity. But people have come here and have gone into their own ghettos. Ghettos of the mind, physical ghettos. If I take the Somali immigrants, they live in an area which we now call Mogadishu. But the problems of Somalia and the, the tensions in Mogadishu are being played out in <laughs> South Africa. Can we afford that? That is going to lead to xenophobia once again here. Yeah. Because South Africans are going to look at this and say, do we actually need this? And those communities need to understand they cannot ghettoize themselves, either in the mind or physically. Because I think the dignity of that individual the coming here is important. Now, when we say that and Nazarene had said that 
Europe is going to actually come to Africa. Europe came to South, uh, to South Africa and Africa long ago. They came as colonialists. They came as refugees from the, the uh, religious wars that were being fought uh, in the Netherlands then. The, all the Dutch Protestants are here, all the Catholics are in, in Holland. So we, we've had Europe here already, but Europe here in a very different way. As colonizers, uh, as exploiters, and that is the perception, and bringing of other communities that came as migrants through slavery and through indentured labor. Uh, with those few words, let me say thank you very much. But I think importantly for this organization is to have the discussion and the conversation is how do we assist in trying to bring a solution to Libya? If we bring a solution to Libya, we're going to impact upon the wise people, and then there are wise people in, in Tunisia. The Tunisian uh, uprising didn't go the same way as Libya or Egypt. Um, it will also impact upon Algeria, but it also brings to another, a, another sore point in Africa. That is the question of the Sahrawi and Polisario people who are also under occupation by Moroccans. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mustanga. Thank you very much. And there, there are words which center around dignity, with respect, justice, and extremely chilling words of um, migrants being used as slaves. Um, and I think, as you, as, as you said, that if we find the solution to the Libyan solution, then what this panel discussion here is today about, um, we will go somewhere to resolving, um, giving some dignity back to, to people fleeing from, from these areas. And that brings me to... Um, Ayo. Ayo. Ayo Oh, thank, thank you. you. Um, and I want to thank the Common Action Forum for inviting me to be a part of this um, Panel. It's been interesting listening to everybody um, because, in a way, we started with Mohammed giving an idea about what could be done in societies to prevent people, you know, to, to deal with the push factors that drive people out. And I, I did find myself wondering, Nasni, whether I'm included in those um, 258 million, because I also live in a country in which I was not born. But um, in my case, I was born in Britain and I live in Nigeria. And of course, with regard to Libya, it is, um, uh, it's one of the main gateways now for irregular migration. The funny thing is that this morning I opened my um, email and uh, one of the groups that I'm on was saying that um, a, a journalist that we have in Nigeria, Sheikh Wadeni, is about to launch a book. And the book is going to be about, um, about migration and, um, or irregular, you know, from, and his, his, the title of his book is From Frying Pan to Fire. And um, basically he's saying not only is the journey itself a dangerous journey, but that when you get there, it's not all it's cracked up to be. So I sort of said, um, I sent a message to him saying, Shed, you, you kept your research secret, and there I was trying to find out some figures about what is happening, because I looked at the title of this topic, it said Deadly Migration. And um, in Shedron's book, he gave the figure, he, he quoted an Associated Press report in the Washington Post, which said 56,800 dead and missing, the hidden toll of migration. Um, now, in my case, I was focusing on the, the Nigerian aspect of it, because many Nigerians do pass through Libya. And in the old days of Gaddafi, um, Nigerians were going, and, um, every, and Gaddafi would round them up and catch them. And um, then he would call Obasanjo, our then head of state, and say, look, I've got some of your people here. You know, Obasanjo would say, okay, I'll send a plane. He will send a plane and bring them back to Nigeria, and um, for a while after the end of the Gaddafi um, regime, 
that, that system wasn't working. Now, because of um, international reports about Nigerians being sold as slaves in the markets in Libya, the government has re, um, revived the policy of sending planes from time to time to bring Nigerians back home. But um, uh, the headline that I was able to find, I'm sorry, I, <laughs> last time I gave the speech, I discovered that everybody else had visual presentations. So I prepared a visual presentation. And all you can see, which is most of you can't see, but what this headline of a, on a Nigerian paper says is that illegal migration, 10,000 Nigerians die in Mediterranean Sea and deserts. And that's the Nigerian immigration service giving these figures. And this, they were talking about just one year the, um, um, of, of, of migration. Um, and this is what he said, if I may quote, smuggling of migrants is taking a front burner in world affairs today. Almost every day you hear stories of boat capsizing and people trying to reach Europe. Nigerians are dying every day. This year alone, 4,900 Nigerians died on the Mediterranean route to Europe. There are countless others who died on their way through the deserts. We've even lost count. Many more perished on that route. In fact, over 10,000 people have died on the Mediterranean route and the deserts. Those who died in the deserts are far, far more than the dead victims along the Mediterranean route. There is the need to create awareness within our community that going to Europe is not an option, particularly if it is through irregular routes. So I think I hope that illustrates why we have to talk about this as a deadly topic. And of course, we know that um, the people who are trying to reach Europe from um, other parts of the world, um, be it Syria, or even as far afield as Afghanistan, are facing really terrible pre perils. Um, however, I think um, we should say that unlike their West African counterparts, and of course, because of its size, the size of its population, Nigeria has the largest share, but other countries in the sub-region also contribute their quota. But Unlike most of us from West Africa, the people trying to enter Europe from countries like Eritrea or Syria, Iran, Iraq and Afghanistan are in fact fleeing deadly persecution. It's not to say that some West Africans don't also claim asylum or even that they don't have reason to, but most of them are just moving around the globe as people have done over the millennia in search of something different, a better life. But those traveling to Africa, from Africa to Europe through these irregular routes tend to make the international news headlines only when they perish or when they run the risk of perishing if they're not rescued from the flimsy craft in which they've been put to sea by people smugglers in or around the Mediterranean or when they make it to the shores of the Mediterranean. But asylum seekers fleeing war and persecution in Syria and Iraq made headlines in Europe as soon as it became clear that they were indeed fleeing and that the main place to which they were fleeing was Europe. But um, in my um, pre preparation, I, I said that we should pause before we get to Europe and talk about what we mean by immigration. But fortunately, Nazneen had, um, had done that, you know, the distinction between migrant. I mean, uh, quite frankly, if you are living outside Britain and you hear the word talking about, you hear the way that the media there talk about migration, you will normally hear them talk about either illegal immigrants or bogus asylum seekers. And uh, the concept that people might have a real reason to seek asylum is um, really just by the, by the way. Um, uh, but we also have this expression, expatriate workers, and um, it's one of the words that's used to, to separate the black and the brown from, the, from those who are not black or brown. Although it's not entirely a racial division, it, it could also be a class thing as well. I mean, my, my daughter put out word that she's looking for someone to, she wants to employ somebody to fill her old job as an executive assistant. And many of the, reply, of the many replies that she got, one said, included the cryptic statement, I'm an expatriate. And we were sort of wondering, well, what, what does that mean? Is the applicant not a Nigerian? And even if they're not, does that mean they don't have to have a CV or a work permit? I mean, actually it turned out the person was an, a non-Nigerian living in Lagos, so they were thinking they were interested in the job. 
So, um, uh, you know, there are all these different words that we use to, dis to divide ourselves. But in the title of this topic, the immigration in question is not that of the expatriate workers swanning around from one executive position to the next management job. No, it's the movement of poor people to rich countries. And those numbers have shown a marked increase up to 2017. Um, I quoted from the same article in that newspaper item that head was headed about the Nigerian Stein. Um, uh, just the numbers of people and the huge numbers that are coming. But let me move on to the issue of Europe. Um, however, at a time when the president of the US has promised to deploy the US army to combat an invasion of people fleeing danger in their own home countries in Latin or Central or South America, I think we don't need to limit our observations to the European continent. We should rightly also turn our observations to the countries that were settled or largely made their own by Europeans and their descendants, such as Canada or Australia. Now, the next picture that I had was this famous picture of um, Alan Kursi, the um, young Kurdish boy who, well, whose dead body was seen on the beach. In, um, he was fleeing from the war in Syria. And I also had a picture of these coffins of 300 migrants who had died and um, they'd, you know, they'd been perished at sea and their bodies had been brought ashore to Italy and they were put into these um, coffins. And the picture actually shows EU delegates paying tribute to the Lampedusa victims. And at that time, it reflected the concern and soul-searching that these um, events were provoking in Europe. But as they say, the first cut may be the deepest, but it changed. The narrative of compassion and fellow feeling was quickly overtaken by this. And this is an advertisement that was put out in the campaign for Brexit, where um, uh, the people who wanted Britain to leave the European Union, it's called Breaking Point, and it's a snapshot of people who are fleeing from the war in Syria. And it just makes it look as if, you know, they're, you know, they're shoulder to shoulder marching and they're about to invade us in Europe and we all need to be very much afraid. So unfortunately, it's the scars that remain. Yes, we still have the uncounted numbers of good-hearted, ordinary citizens in Europe and other West, rich West Af West Western countries who themselves take risks to rescue and assist migrants and asylum seekers. You see them at the jungle in Calais, trying to, or on its successes now, trying to make provision for people who are trying to get to Britain to join their family and friends. But their everyday acts of decency and kindness towards fellow human beings are now either at risk of being forgotten, or worse, are the subject of active vilification, not just from mean-hearted individuals, but from their own elected representatives and even from their own governments. So my next picture comes from another time and another place. And unfortunately, it's really too small to see. It's black and white, but it's a boat full of people, again, people who are desperate, who are fleeing. But these people happen to be, here's another one of people fleeing. Again. But these happen to be what were called the boat people. Um, I mean, I mentioned Australia time, earlier on. Time. And, um, time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I should stop. I just wanted to um, talk about Australia in the mm. context of the rise of right wing politics. Because when Australia was facing similar situation to what we um, are seeing now with regard to Europe, that is, people in your vicinity coming to your country and wanting admission. Australia at first welcomed people with open arms, but then they started saying, look, these people are jumping the queue. And it's not that we don't want to admit them, not that we don't want to have them in our community, because in fact, Australia had made a good effort in terms of, or of um, managed migration and assimilating people. I mean, it's taken in many people from Vietnam. And once it ended its whites-only policy, it has been able to become much more reflective of its own neighborhood, which is in you know, um, South 
um, very close to Southeast Asia and so on. So it's been able to do something which partly, possibly because it's in itself an immigrant community. I mean, just like the United States, basically the indigenous people were not quite eradicated, but certainly pushed to the side. Whereas in Europe, there's this, they start from a position of we're not an immigrant, we are the indigents of Europe, and therefore these people coming in cannot just come in and change our identity. So you find that in an increasingly secular Europe, suddenly people are clinging to we are Christians um, and these people are Muslims. I think also um, if we look at the rise of the right-wing politics, it's difficult for us to close our eyes to the fact that there's an active factor of groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS, which specifically want to drive a wedge between Muslims who live in, the, in Europe and um, the rest of the community, so that people will um, equate the word Muslim with the word terrorist, and therefore look on every Muslim with suspicion, and that will in turn turn Muslims against the communities in which they have been living together. And so there are, there are two factors in it. But in the end, I found that I wasn't really able to put my finger on why Europe has seen this rise of right-wing politics, and maybe because my time is up, I will okay. quick, quickly say that. I would have said plenty, but my time is up, and therefore I will leave it to the, the questioners who, to, 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 to put their finger on why the right wing has taken such a Thank hold you. on European politics. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'll pick up on uh, a few of um, what I was talking about and the striking statistic of 56,000 dead and hidden in light of legal frameworks, UN conventions, who should bear most of that responsibility? These are some of the burning questions I hope that the audience is going to be asking. Where does that duty of care lie? Is it a shared responsibility? Should migrants traveling from Africa, should Africa turn on itself and look for the solutions? Is it the EU that should lead with this? Irredeemably circular. We know that. And the heart-wrenching photos um, of the infamous photo of Alain Koshi. Um, but yet, in the face of that, the narrative changed. Yes, it began with empathy. And then we know the correlation and the fear factor and the rise of the right wing. And we haven't had much time to discuss that in a panel, and I'm hoping that the audience here will raise some of those important questions. So um, without further ado, I think we're running on a tight schedule. If we can have the roving mic and uh, yes, yeah, just Shout out, if it's OK. Uh, my, name is Hassan. Uh, just okay. my name is Hassan Patal from the UK. Uh, the actual panel discussion that the immigration into Europe and the rise of the right wing, I you finished saying, well, what are the key causes of the rise of the right wing? What are the failures of the left wing? Interesting. Is that for anybody anyone, in particular? That's fine. Well, I think that, should I answer? Or yes, okay. okay. I, I think that um, Shouldn't we take one of the things that we notice is that right wing Shouldn't. politics is not necessarily only done by right wingers. You find that, um, just as you saw in Australia, the, the Labour Party was implementing these policies of um, uh, detaining people on arrival and so on, you find it, um, that people are trying to outflank the extreme right, and in doing so, they're moving in that direction. And I think that they're not ready to stand up and talk about the benefits of immigration, partly because it's not just an economic matter. I mean, the statistics can come out and show GDP improves and so on and so forth. But if you don't address the issue of the cultural and social factors, then you, you really don't, you, you're, you're in a way, even if you're a left winger, you're um, uh, first of all accused of suppressing the discussion in the name of political correctness, and then of pretending that it doesn't exist. So I think that's part of the failure. I think Wada would like to come in on that question there. 
You know, the first question is to ask, actually, about Malaysia. Recognizing the fact that the Malay majority of the society did not have the same economic status like the others, we had the affirmative action for the last more than 40 years or more. In South Africa, we had the same concept, and we introduced the concept of black empowerment. Now, objectively, to what extent these kind of of uh, policies could redeem the gap between the privileged and the disprivileged, number one. And the second question also, maybe to yourself and to Mr. Dambur, is to what extent these kind of policies could reinforce nationalism and sometimes even a feeling of difference, differentiation within the same society and maybe interrupt on long run the uh, harmony that could be created in these societies. The last question to Mr. Dango later on is a historical issue. Do you really think that if the visit of the five presidents to Qaddafi at that time would have achieved the target of stopping the military intervention and resolve the issue of violence against the population? Just, you know, if you can ask that, answer that would be great. Do you want to answer the first question? Sure. So, um, I think that uh, there are arguments for uh, what the uh, positive legacy of the new economic policy, which uh, essentially was the affirmative action program put in place in Malaysia, has uplifted Malays. Um, I think when you look at questions like that, you always have to wonder, for example, the argument, you know, India is better off because the British came and built all these railroads. Assumption was that Indians wouldn't have built railroads uh, had, the, uh, had the British not come. You know, um, the argument in, in the, the Malay context is that Malays are lazy inherently and therefore uh, will always be disadvantaged and will always need these policies to be able to compete effectively with the Chinese. That's obviously the kind of argument that a racist person would make. And uh, that racist person would probably then use that as a pre pretext or a precursor to uh, stay in power to protect those people who would otherwise be gobbled up by some evil uh, force. So I, I think your second point is correct, that um, uh, uh, is, is the right thing to focus on, which is that to what extent do these um, uh, constructs affect the trajectory of a nation and whether that is a good or a bad thing. Um, I think what I would hope uh, the uh, new government in Malaysia is able to do is to create a new narrative that um, poor people are deserving of support from institutions, uh, irrespective of their, uh, uh, their backgrounds and that it's really up to uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, ability to have good governance to make sure that um, the vast sums of money which fly out of countries in the form of uh, you know, money laundering and, and other sort of illicit transfers, that that money stays in the country and really benefits the people. And I think um, uh, if, if that does happen, then uh, you would be able to um, demonstrate that uh, uh, identities are essentially things which can be constructed in a positive and beneficial way or in a very harmful way. And uh, the people who actually control uh, the, um, the institutions in a country have a responsibility to play in creating narratives that are um, healthy and integrate people and integrate knowledge and make people feel that um, they are uh, they have, they have a place in the country. And I think just to um, you know, uh, sort of tie again the issue of migration, I mean, there's obviously the um, crisis in Myanmar, vast numbers of uh, Rohingya refugees spilling uh, out throughout the Southeast Asia region. Um, it's a problem that Malaysia has to deal with. I think all the countries in the region have to deal with as well. Again, which, which has to do both with wh whether we can absorb or whether Malaysians can absorb and the other countries in the region can absorb those populations. And also, uh, obviously, the more complicated issue of dealing with the government that's responsible for that. Uh, let me respond to what yes. okay. uh, Interestingly, the two of us had met in Libya during that crisis at that particular point in time. Oh, it was after that. I think that if an African solution was allowed to take place to an African problem, which was Libya, possibly the outcome could have been very different. It would not have been a military outcome, but a political solution could have been found 
Gaddafi could have left uh, and left the players behind to talk to each other to actually try and resolve the problem. But beyond that, I don't think that some of the powers actually wanted a solution in Libya. When Tariq Mitri was on the point of trying to bring all the people together as the representative of the uh, Security Council General Secretary, he was removed. He was the one person who could actually have the depth and understanding of doing that. The UN then brought in somebody who took money from one of the uh, uh, regional powers that were playing there. And the UN actually lost credibility in that. So this is why it is that the UN alongside now, I mean, at that particular point in time, it was then, and I believe it could have happened, but I think now the UN alongside the African Union with the five presidents needs to facilitate uh, a process to find a political solution now and to bring all the parties together, inclusive, leave nobody out, including the Gaddafiites. Bring them on board so that you can actually find a Libya that can move forward, a government of national unity, whatever. But the Libyans must talk amongst themselves and find those solutions. But the Libyans are not going to find solutions like the South Africans couldn't find solutions while the other powers were trying to influence it. We need to actually become the facilitators of solutions rather than trying to control the situation. Going back to the question of black economic empowerment, I was hoping that that kind of thing could come in my next session because I'm dealing with non-racialism and those kind of matters and I have other South Africans there. Uh, could I deal with that matter in the next session, if you don't mind? Yes. Can we take um, two? Questions in one go. Sorry, I can't see for this podium here. Um, two more questions, and then yes. So can we have yours, Michael, and then the gentleman? Uh, sorry, yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you. <coughs> it's Helen Muloy. Uh, I thought the panel would answer the question that was asked by the lady there about who's responsible about this. Let me start about saying, for an example, 1994 Rwanda genocide. Uh, is the Belgium responsible for that? Uh, let me speak about um, Saddam Hussein. Is America, Tony Blair, and the Americans responsible for that? And on Gaddafi, is Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama? Because if you look back, uh, George W. Bush considered that he was wrong. Barack Obama considered that he was wrong about Libya. So who is responsible about this? You look at Cameroon, people are dying, serious calamities. Is Anglophone and Francophone, who is responsible if we could answer that question? Let's forget about uh, immigration making uh, America or, 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 or Europe rich. Let's speak about calamities that are happening on the ground. Who is responsible about this? Thank you. This is just a quick follow-up. Um, Michael Amoa from the NSC London. Just a quick follow-up to Wanda's question about whether if an African solution had been allowed, would they have stopped um, Libya? Um, before the five presidents would even attempt to go see Gaddafi, you would remember that South Africa Nigeria and Gabon, who were representing Africa on the UN Security Council, had already voted for the no-fly zone. They had already betrayed the continent. And I think the point I want to make is that Africa should always be on the ball. When it really mattered, they betrayed the continent. And by the time they tried even to get anyone to go talk to, um, to intervene the African solution, it was just too little, too late. I just wondered if you may have something to say on that. I thought the session had to do with uh, immigration, but I see it's got to do with Libya. <laughs> and my problem is wherever I go, where I can talk about the world being square, I'll get a question about Libya. Yes, African nations voted for that particular resolution. Without the African nations, there would not have been nine votes. 
or that resolution. And NATO would have been in a situation where their bombing would again be as illegal as it was in Iraq. But African nations had taken a position that they were afraid of what was going to happen in Benghazi. And I think Gaddafi's statement the night before of we'll find the rats in every street, in every corner, influenced somewhat the voting. I'm not sure if all of that had to do with that. I think also it had to do with the influence of the US on African nations. And my own view at that time, and I expressed it quite publicly, that my own state should have listened to me. I was on the ground and not listened to, to other people. And Africans, but of course the African Union then came up with the African Union plan. It was after the, the, the vote was taken. And the vote by any necessary means uh, gave NATO the opportunity <coughs> to use any necessary means. And their issue, and it goes to the issue of the right to protect civilians, which is an important issue that we all need to support. Did they protect civilians beyond that? The right to protect civilians, was it beyond that? The, uh, is it there now? It's not there now. So the right to protect was abused for the agendas of people who had different agendas. And the problem with Libya is it's got the curse of resources. Uh, can, uh, as the governor of the Reserve Bank of Libya who came here a couple of months ago said to me, you know, maybe if we owed the World Bank money, we would not have been bombed. <laughs> uh, these are all the kind of questions that come out uh, in, in, in politics. But I think if we're going to be, instead of being problem oriented and analyzing what had happened, we need to become solution oriented to find out what we as the collective community, the, the, the world, the states, and civil society can do. Because civil society, I think, can draw people together. Draw people together to talk to each other, to find a solution amongst themselves. To find a Libyan solution to Libyan problems and not an Italian or French solution to Libyan problems. Thank you. Before we answer the final question, if we can take, uh, take this question here, and then the panel can answer the question. I can't see for this podium. So. You didn't reply to his question. Yes, yes. I wanted to reply to his question. Yes, okay. Just very briefly, I, I share your frustration and I share your pain. And I think you can't just point the finger at one entity or one body. I think everyone's to blame. The UN needs to be doing far more. National governments need to be doing far more. This, the issues that you're talking about are transnational issues. Everything's connected. So you, you've got human trafficking, arms trafficking, drugs trafficking, all across the continent. Everything is connected. And Africa needs to work, African nations need to work together to come up with solutions to these problems. And as far as the African Union is concerned, I think it needs to stop being just a talking shop and actually deal with some of these issues and uh, make, make a difference and make a change. Thank you. Yes, we'll take this last question just here. Thank we you have two uh, questions. Coming back to the topic, uh, you know, the issue is uh, the rise of right-wing nationalism and the challenge of Islamophobia and bigotry and all the connected phobias. I think I, I look at the problem in, in phases. I think the first phase of this specter of, of Muslim hordes moving into Europe was around about 7-Eleven, when African Muslims moved into Spain. The second phase was probably in the late 60s, when guest workers from Turkey decided to relocate into the rest of Europe, particularly in, into Germany. And then in the late 90s, you had this mass refugee crisis resulting from the uh, Balkan War. And latter day is the 
migration and, and refugees coming from the Middle East. Now, I think there's a, there's a strain and, and the strand that we need to look at <coughs> from 7-11 to present day. And it is about the construction of the Muslim identity and the intellectual and political project that has gone into this Islamophobia. And it is not done in a vacuum. In fact, if you look at this counterfactual paragraph that Edwin Gibbons wrote in the rise and decline of the Roman Empire, and he said, if the Muslims were not defeated in 733 at the Battle of Tours, then in the schools of Oxford, the teachers would be teaching the various interpretations of the Quran, and the circumcised mobs would be listening to the revealed truths of Muhammad. So if you look at that, uh, 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 creation of the, uh, uh, the, the, the Islamophobic identity, it is very important in how uh, 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 right-wing governments are now looking at the refugee crisis. Okay, I'll end it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, and uh, I've been told that time is up. And I leave you with a final quote um, from Kwame Nkrumah. The forces that unite us are intrinsic and greater than that superimposed influences that keep us apart. The work of Common Action Forum is more important than ever now to bring unity and harmonization in the face of the challenges of the world that we live in today. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.